I grew up in a household with two atheists, my father and my sister. From time to time, we would have lively discussions about whether God exists. And during these conversations, my mother, who had fled a very strict Southern Baptist upbringing when she was a teenager, she would remain a neutral observer. But my father and my sister would get quite animated. And it seemed to me that their atheism was fueled by two things, incredulity and anger. They were incredulous that people could believe in a superhuman up in the sky who grants or denies our wishes and determines our eternal fate. There was just no logic or reason to that. And they were angry that organized religion used the image of a judging, punishing God to instill fear in people and to control their lives, choices, and behavior. Well, I understood their points. In fact, I agreed with many of their points. And yet I always left these conversations feeling frustrated. And now I know why. My sister and my father were rejecting a specific concept of God. And I wanted them to consider a different concept of God. Well, it turns out atheism doesn't work that way. Actually, by definition, atheism rejects a specific concept of God, not all concepts of God. The word atheism actually means, quote, disbelief in the existence of a supreme being or beings. It refutes the theistic concept of God as a supernatural power external to the world. But as Bishop John Shelby Spong so perfectly pointed out, quote, the alternative to theism is not atheism. It's a new experience of what the transcendent is all about. You know, many atheists who have experienced the transcendent have discovered a whole new understanding of God that they not only embrace, but revere. Albert Einstein and Charles Darwin are two examples. Both of these so-called atheists actually believed in God. It just happened to be a different kind of God. They did not believe in a personal God who sits in judgment and rewards and punishes his creatures according to their behavior. They didn't believe in God as a super being in the sky who created the universe in six days, 6,000 years ago. For Einstein and Darwin, God was much grander, more amazing, and more mysterious than that. Einstein beheld God's handiwork in the intricacies of physics and mathematics and the wonders of the universe. He believed in a universal mind or a spirit that transcended the universe and was beyond our comprehension. Einstein spent his life trying to comprehend the order, quote, deeply hidden behind everything, and describe it mathematically. In a 1930 essay on religion and science in the New York Times Magazine, Einstein said he had a, quote, cosmic religious sense, unquote, of, quote, the mobility and mar the nobility and marvelous order which are revealed in nature and in the world of thought. He also believed in eternity. And he said, there is, after all, something eternal that lies beyond the hand of fate and of all human delusions. Charles Darwin had a similar reverence for God's creation and marveled at the mystery behind it all. His theory of evolution was not a condemnation, but a revelation of how God as the creative force had established the patterns, the laws, and the ways of existence. Darwin was awestruck by a God who so brilliantly embedded in his creation its own ability to create and evolve. 
He himself said, when I wrote The Origin of Species, my faith in God was as strong as that of a bishop. Does that surprise you? Krista Tippett is the author of a book called Einstein's God. She also hosts the NPR program On Being. She says it is not at all uncommon for scientists to be spiritual. She writes, quote, scientists are often seekers who are motivated by a sense of awe and wonder, unquote. Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, and Newton all believed their discoveries would and should widen human comprehension of the nature of God. Today, Francis Collins is the director of the National Institutes of Health. He's also the former head of the Human Genome Project, which studied DNA. He went from being an atheist to being a believer in God after witnessing, quote, the amazing complexity, diversity, and awesome beauty evident in even the tiniest elements of creation. The sense of awe and reverence for creation often leads to a spirituality that is mystical, wherein we experience a sense of oneness with the divine. Albert Einstein wrote, quote, the most beautiful emotion we can experience is the mystical. It is the sower of all true art and science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger is as good as dead. To know that what is impenetrable to us really exists, manifesting itself to us as the highest wisdom and the most radiant beauty, which our dull faculties can comprehend only in their most primitive forms. This knowledge, this feeling, is at the center of all true religiousness. In this sense, and in this sense only, he wrote, I belong to the ranks of devoutless, devoutly religious men. So much for the conflict between science and spirituality. This idea of the mystical, mysterious, transcendent God being described here actually aligns beautifully with what we teach in unity. You see, in unity, we do not teach that God is a being, but rather God is beingness. I think of God as the great, overarching, transcendent presence that is also imminent and inexplicable within us. It is the one power, one presence in all of life. And it has as its central quality this mysterious sort of higher order that unfolds through creation into greater complexity, greater beauty, and ever greater what we would call goodness. You see, we really can't explain God, but we can experience God. Ultimately, God is a mystery, and that's okay. That's okay for me. I actually love that. I love the sense of awe and wonder that I have at things that I can't comprehend. I love to just give it up to, to something beyond me, something we haven't figured out yet, but is yet good. And these phenomena that you know all of us on the spiritual path kind of, kind of encounter from time to time, intuition, premonition, deja vu, coincidences, synchronicity, all of these things to me are both mystifying and delightful, are they not? Several years ago, I was getting ready to uh, marry a couple, and I had my conversation with them preparing for their wedding, etc. and I said, hey, if you would like, I can get a calligrapher to write your names in really beautifully, beautiful lettering on your marriage license, and then you can have that framed. And they're like, oh, that'd be so cool. We would love that. It's like, great. As soon as the conversation was over, I called up the calligrapher, only to find that she'd moved away, and she no longer does calligraphy. So this was a, oh, dear moment. 
And I began looking around for somebody that knew calligraphy. Nobody knew anybody. I was striking out. The day was approaching to get this thing done. I was just, just about ready to give up and tell this couple, sorry, we're not going to be able to do that. And then I was sitting in my office one day, and I noticed a woman standing out in front of our bulletin boards looking at the postings there. I'd never seen her before, so I stepped out and started talking to her. She said she, her name was Jennifer, and that she had just been walking by our building. She'd never been here before, but she was walking by our building, and she suddenly felt compelled to come in. She said, I don't know why. I just got the message that I'm supposed to come in here. I said, well, how sweet is that? So turns out Jennifer was an artist. I started talking to her about her art and the things that we have here at Unity Renaissance. I invited her to come to church sometime, and just as she was getting ready to leave, I said, by the way, do you happen to know calligraphy? Sure, she says. Really? I said, <laughs> do you think that you could inscribe a marriage certificate by, like, tomorrow? She goes, I'd be happy to do that. Now, how did these things happen, right? I mean, Jennifer actually, Jennifer Thomas, she ended up coming to church here. She did a lot of marriage certificates for us. She was a member, taught in our school until she, in our um, youth ed, until she moved to Georgia. But why do these things happen? You know, they happen, they happen to you as well. There's so much in our world that we don't understand today. There's so many different factors at, at work. Like, how do the energetic fields and the vibrations that everything is emitting, how do they attract and how do they influence one another? Right? How do the right people show up at the right time? Even looking at quantum physics, it's pretty mind-blowing. What is the universe really made up of? Because the scientists tell us that if you look at the tiniest, the tiniest particles, subatomic particles, and you dig and you dig and you get right down to the very center of them, there's nothing there. There's nothing in the middle of them. And how does prayer work? We don't really know, right? And how is it that we're all connected? You see, what we, what we, don't, what we lack in understanding, we can practice in appreciation and that sense of awe and wonder. And then when the inexplicable graces come into our lives, we can just say to ourselves, oh, that's God. That's God. Don't understand it, but that's how I choose to see it. Back in May, I went up to visit my daughter and her family. It was my granddaughter Maya's first birthday, so I went up for the party, and it was, it was fabulous. We got up there on the day of her birthday. We were running a little bit late. We were going over to my son-in-law Rich's, uh, his parents' house. They were hosting the big birthday party. So we're rushing around getting everything together, and Rich, my son-in-law, said, I'm going to go get the car. They live in Upper Manhattan, so it's kind of a big deal to get the car and all that. So we went down to get the car, and Emily and I gathered up Maya and all of her belongings and whatnot, and then Rich called to say that he was downstairs with the car. But when my daughter answered the phone, she said, oh, no. Are you okay? And as it turned out, Rich, in his hurrying to get there, when he made the U-turn and the busy street that they live on, he had clipped a parked car. And he was very upset. And we went downstairs, and it was obvious that he was shaken by this. And we all took a look at it, and it was this great, big, black, shiny, new-looking SUV with now a great big long scrape of the front left fender. Rich just felt so bad. He was beating himself up. I, I, shouldn't, have been <clears throat> I shouldn't have been going so fast, had this happen on his daughter's birthday, all this stuff going on. He took a piece of paper, he went over and he wrote, it took a little bit of time actually, he wrote this note to the owner of the vehicle and put that note in their windshield. And off we went to the party. We ended up having a wonderful birthday party. But I also knew, because Rich is a very sensitive guy, that this was kind of hanging over his head. So we got back, and it was about dusk. And miraculously, we found a parking space almost right in front of their apartment building. It was a couple spaces back from the black SUV, which was still parked there. Whew. So we gathered up our stuff, and we were just about to go in 
to their apartment building. And when you looked, and we saw a woman standing by the driver's side of the black SUV, and she was reading the note that Rich had left there. She was wearing scrubs. I think she must have just gotten off uh, work from the hospital. She was reading this note, and so we sort of froze. And we looked at her, and she looked at us. And then she said to Rich, are you the wonderful person who left me this beautiful note? And Rich said, oh, I'm, I feel so bad that I, that I hit your car. You know, of course, I'll pay for the damage. This woman looked to me like, honestly, like an angel, maybe because she was so sweet, and we thought the owner would be so angry. She looked at her car, and she goes, we may be able to buff that out. I'm not too concerned. If my car is, if it knocked the wheels out of alignment, I'll contact you. I have your, I have your contact information here. Well, she never did. But I have to tell you that moment was such a moment of grace because think about it. I certainly thought about it. Think of all the moments in the day, all the, all the seconds, all the interludes, right? This was a matter of like a 30-second exchange. We'd been away all day. Here we were, got the parking space right when she was there. What are the odds of that happening? You can tell yourself, oh, well, that was just a coincidence. That was a happy coincidence. But I say... That's God. That's God. Some of the sweetest, most wonderful moments that we experience. You know, they say God works in mysterious ways and often surprising ways. And that has actually been true also in my family. So my mother, who raised me on the power of positive thinking, when I found unity, she fell in love with it. And when she would come to the services, she would always cry during the peace song because she taught us that song when we were in Brownie Scouts. My sister, still an atheist, lives in rural Florida, but she really loves unity. And she says if she ever did go to church, she would go to unity. And even my beloved father, my die-hard atheist father, eventually found a church that spoke to his heart. He loved it so much. After he went there on a Sunday, he would call me and he would say, you really should listen to this minister. She's so wonderful. And that church was Unity of Delray Beach, Florida, the town my dad grew up in. And that minister was Mary Cupperly, one of the finest, most outstanding ministers in Unity. Albert Einstein said, never lose a holy curiosity. There's always more to learn, to explore, and to understand. And so our job, your job, is to stay open, to pay attention, and enjoy the wonder of it all. Let's turn now to meditation. I invite you to get comfortable in your seat. Just relax. Close your eyes if you wish. Take a deep breath in. Release, 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 and let it go. Become attuned to your own breathing. the beating of your heart. The miracle of your own physical body working this very moment to serve you. And take a moment now in your mind's eye to sort of scan the landscape of your life people you love, people who love you, the sights and sounds and experiences that have touched your heart so deeply. How beautiful, how wondrous, how amazing. I 
invite you, you to steep yourself in this energy of the mystic, the mystery, the grandness, the sweetness of something higher than you that is working in and through and as you. Let go of your thoughts, worries, concerns. Sweep them aside and open up to the radiant presence of God blessing you for a few moments in the silence. this presence, we begin to feel gratitude within us. We go forward from this sacred time together, seeing eyes, the wonders of the world, the wonders of life, the many blessings all around us and within us. We're so grateful for those who paved the way for our expanding consciousness, our deepening knowledge, and we go forward to do our part, to keep learning and growing always turning our thoughts and our sights to greater love and the God of our understanding. And so it is, and so we let it be. Amen. Flow, spirit, flow through me. As I open up to be an expression of your unfolding peace, show, spirit, show through me. As I open up to be an expression of your unfolding.